Our scripture reading for this morning is found in the book of Acts, chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. When they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. So is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. This passage may seem a little odd for a Easter season celebration, but it actually fits in beautifully. Because you see, the Sunday after Easter can be very difficult for a lot of churches to deal with. Last Sunday, there was very little gray and blue fabric to see in our pews. I had never seen this place so filled. It was different. But the chatter from a lot of our people who are here a lot of the time said, isn't it wonderful to see the church so full again? But here we are this Sunday, and we see a lot of fabric in the pews. You see, the question of Easter isn't just, wow, what a great party is, and how do we keep that buzz going? The question is, how do we respond to that resurrection? What does it really mean, and how do we really embody that God sent his son, he was died and buried, and he rose from that grave? How does that affect us here, 2,000 plus years later, with the same excitement, with the same vigor, with the same drive that it did those disciples so long ago? And because it has been a celebration of the year, of the church year after year, it is hard sometimes to make it exciting. Because it's not fresh. It's not new. It's a season that we go through many times as we are ourselves born and go through this world and eventually go be with the Father. There's a man that I know. I wouldn't call him a very close friend. I'd call him a strong acquaintance. He is a professional radio man. He has a show on WJR on Saturdays. He pretty much has the career that when I left college, I thought I would have, because I, too, have a degree in broadcasting. My communication degree covers a lot of broadcasting. And as I've made the joke before, I have a great face for radio. I thought that's where I was going to end up. This is not radio. (laughs) He was put in a position about 20 years ago where the programming of his station that he was at at the time was beginning to shift. And the program director, the person who is directly responsible for everything that goes out over the air, every word a DJ says, every word a commentator says, every subject that they talk about, every commercial, every song, every endorsement, he is the one or she is the one that is held accountable. He came to my friend one day and said, this is how we're changing the programming. And it was a format that made my friend uncomfortable. It didn't make him uncomfortable because he disagreed with what they were doing. It made him uncomfortable because he was budding and new in his faith. And he felt that God was telling him, there's something not right about this. So the pressure of his employer a human authority, was starting to collide, create problems with what his spiritual authority, his God, was telling him to do. He went to his supervisor and said, you know, I'm really struggling with this. And like a lot of supervisors who are under pressure, he said, I will give you X amount of days to think about this, and then I need an answer. And my friend said, okay, 
And as he was turning and walking out the door of the program director's office, the program director added this one little twist. By the way, if you can't get on board, polish up your resume. Well, my friend couldn't get on board. And he went to the program director, who had been his friend for 20-some-odd years, and he said, you know, I just can't do this. My faith doesn't settle well with this. I'm not sleeping well because of this. And his friend, his boss, said, then I'll give you two weeks. And, I ha and in that time, I need to find a successor. So he left radio for a while. He did a few other things, but he eventually got back into it on a very part-time basis, and he in still enjoys it. He still loves it. But he made a decision in that moment that if he wanted to truly follow the path that God put before him, to truly be a disciple of Jesus, that he had to sometimes say no to the world when it was putting him in places that did not go along with the teachings of his faith, what he believed, what he embraced. I admire him greatly for that. And at the same time, when I face those situations, those obstacles, I'm terrified. What will tomorrow bring? How will I provide for my family? How will I be able to do something that gives me satisfaction? How can I make sure that I position myself where I can glorify God and still be loved and enjoyed and embraced by everyone else around me? It's not an easy thing to do. But then here's the question. What does the power of the resurrection mean to me? Is it something that I just come out and celebrate and use it when it's to my convenience? Or is it something that I recognize should be first and foremost in my mind? And when I hit those tragedies, not walk into them, I mean collide. Tragedy is like a collision. It's a surprise. You don't expect it to happen. And all of your programming and way of dealing with things just gets thrown up and you get all befuddled and confused and overwhelmed. And you'll make a fast decision, a rash decision, but not necessarily a good decision. Because when we're in tragedy, it is very easy to think, how am I going to get through this? Instead of stopping and realizing, you know, there is an authority that is greater and stronger than me. And that's God, who sent his son into this world. And he didn't send him just with a job to do. He sent him with a ministry to perform to bring the world back to God, because the world has gotten away from God. Up until this point in time in history, religion had become a nasty thing, a lot like religion is a nasty word today. It's institutionalized about texts and traditions and rules and formats, and not so much focused on making sure that anyone who walks through its doors have a good, strong spiritual encounter when they gather to worship. Have an uplifting feeling when two or more are gathered in his name. Take time to really come together as a body outside of worship and focus and grow in the scriptures. Instead, it's about the color of the carpeting, how nicely the walls are painted, what our stained glass looks like. My goodness, it's cold this morning. Those become the priorities of churches that have become religious and institutionalized. They forget the fundamental primary missional element which is to come in, be touched by the movement of God and the Spirit, and then to go out into the world and share what you have had with others. Does it mean taking your Bible and shoving it under someone's nose and say, you need to believe in Jesus? I say no. But it does mean that when you are faced with situations that are difficult or places where you have celebration, you understand you're not alone that the God who refused to abandon his son to the grave is the same God who refused to abandon us when we face the ups and downs of our lives. How do we respond to the resurrection? Let me give you a modern parable. 
In any town, USA, there's a little church. And in that little church, there's a little boy named Philip. Every Sunday, Philip attended Sunday school with the other eight-year-olds and of boys and girls that were there at the church, but Philip did not fit in, for he was born with Down's syndrome. And with his differences, he was an easy target for the mocking and the ridicule when he tried to answer questions or play the games. And the results were usual for him, for he would be pushed aside and ignored or made fun of by the other children. The Sunday school teacher did their best to help include Philip, but the other children just could not see past his handicap. So the efforts of the teacher never really worked. On Easter Sunday, the teacher brought in a number of legs pantyhose containers. You remember the ones that came shaped in an oversized plastic egg? She brought in a bunch of those. So you know this was a number of years ago. And she gave one to each student in the entire class. So I guess she had a lot of pantyhose over the years. And gave the following instructions. Let's go outside and find something that represents new life. Put it in the egg, and we'll bring it back inside, and then we'll show it to everybody. So outside they went. They went running all over the place, all over the church property. It was an organized chaos of energetic pandemonium. When they returned to the classroom, they placed the eggs on the table, and one by one they were opened. Egg after egg was met with an ooh or an ah of finding a flower, a butterfly a new leaf. Obviously, that wasn't in Michigan. Not on a day like today. Then they opened the last one, and there was nothing inside. The children stood and looked at it, and then one of them explained, someone's a real idiot. I guess they learned to say that from their parents. And now another one said, Boy, that's not fair. And another one said, someone didn't do their assignment. I wonder who that was. And Philip was the one that spoke up. He said, that's my egg. Well, what happened is what you expect to happen. They began to mock and ridicule him. And Philip stood there and took it. And then he finally said, I did so do it right. It's empty. Because the tomb is empty. The children were shocked. The teacher was amazed. For the answer of this boy who would be mocked and ridiculed and rejected gave not merely a message and fulfillment of this assignment, but also revealed a conviction of faith as well, that the resurrection is a real thing. And he wasn't afraid to proclaim it to those who would stand in opposition to him. He was responding to the resurrection. A response that was not afraid. A response that was not embarrassed. A response that did not hold back, knowing that there would be a deluge of negative energy and remarks and maybe even a social outcasting. Once again, he stood there and proclaimed an element of faith, just like my fat friend did to that supervisor so many years ago. How do we respond to the power of the resurrection in this world? It's not easy because we are a species that struggles with our quest for spiritual guidance. We struggle with human beings that are brutal, for we are constantly com competing with each other for resources, affection honors, admissions, and promotions. Life can be a jungle, a rat race, a Jew, which makes us very competitive, jealous, even sometimes violent. We struggle with the fact that life is unfair, 
Some people are wealthy while others die of starvation. Some live to be a hundred while those painfully die before they turn 18. Some are born with wit and intelligence and good looks, while others are born plain, disfigured, and have only modest gifts at best. We struggle with guilt for ourselves, constantly unable to live up to our own minimal standards of right and wrong. We live with self-accusations of conscious, tortured feelings of inadequacy and guilt. And guilt, excuse me. We struggle with our own mortality, knowing that we are here one day and gone the next. The dream of immortality of life, breath and sunshine surrounded by families will always be cut shorter than we think it should be. And in all of this struggle, we hunger for comfort, hunger for answers, Hunger is for things that will give us hope, but also comfort and strength and peace. Not only as we face our struggles, but also as we live through them as well. Have you been to a bookstore or a library lately? The section of motivational speakers, philosophers, psychologists, doctors, medical companies, insurance agents, investment brokers, and anyone who can convince us that they have the answers to help us with our problems of health seems to be growing exponentially. And in their work, they put us in a position where we will recast God in an image, a phrase, an idea, as we cry out for help hope, and peace. But in those times, there is a big thing that we're forgetting. God is not someone to be recast. God is not someone to be caught in a single image. God is not someone to be put together in one simple phrase of 16 words or less. God is the creator, the maker, the helper, and the sustainer. We try to take God and recast him in a way that's easy for us to understand so we don't have to do the work. But God has already presented himself in ways that are so simple and wonderful and beautiful. It's our world that makes it more complex because it teaches us to not trust, not give, not forgive, but to try and have dominance in any little kingdom that you can create, whether it be your home, your place of work, your place of worship, your place of leisure, your place of fun. Even when you go out to a restaurant, I've sat there and I've watched people who will rearrange the entire floor plan if they can just so they can feel confident and secure. When we try to recast God, when we don't see how we need to grow and embrace and be transformed by God, how are we responding to the resurrection? Jesus called his disciples. Fishermen, writers, tax collectors, minor businessmen. And he didn't try and water the gospel down in a way that they would understand simply and succinctly within their own mindsets. Instead, he took them on a journey, a journey in which what they once thought and believed about God grew. It was challenged. It transformed. So that when Jesus was no longer with us, they could walk with a connection, an understanding and a strength and confidence they didn't have before. You see, Peter and the other disciples who are standing before the council in this past were once like those men of the council. They studied and they followed the law, point blank, literally, knowing how to interpret and apply it to their own advantage. But once Jesus came into their lives, once they thought they lost him, And then when they realized that they would never be without him, there was nothing more to be afraid of. Because they knew and they understood that God was with them. So they could stand before the Sanhedrin, the council, the people who could throw them in prison, 
torture them to a point where they would be unrecognizable, even put them to death as they did Jesus our Savior. And knowing that God is with me, and I can speak honestly, and I can speak with integrity, and I can speak with a confidence in knowing that that which I'm saying, God is putting in me. Because I've allowed myself to grow and understand what the resurrection means. You see, it doesn't mean just new life, which a lot of folks water it down to be. The resurrection is being raised into a glorified body. That's how the Apostle Paul describes it. Our Savior, our Jesus, our Lord, our Master, our friend, yes, he was put to death. Yes, he was put in the grave. Yes, he was resurrected. He was not resuscitated. Resuscitated means you are brought back to life and you are that which you were before. No, he was resurrected. And when you are resurrected, you are transformed. You become a glorified body. And in that transformation, there is a fear that you do not have to have. The fear is that body will never, ever die again. It goes all the way back to when Jesus was baptized. He went through those waters. John popped them down. Now, if I was John the Baptist, I would have held him down for just a moment longer. I don't know, I'm just warped that way. He comes up. Yeah, it's okay. You can laugh at that. It's true. I am. My my family will concur. And when Jesus came out, there was a rumbling of the heavens, and a voice spoke. And it was the voice of God that said, This is my Son, the Beloved, the one that I love above all else, uh, in whom I am well pleased. Yeah, that got him through his ministry. That got him through the public rejection. That got him through the people trying to contort and pervert him to fit their image of what God should be. It allowed him to reveal God's love in ways and means that the people were hungering for but never thought were possible. And it was the thing that got him through the resurrection because God didn't forget the promise of his love to his son. He remembered and brought him back transformed him, sent him back so that we could see, have a testimonial witness of the disciples, of the followers, of the believers, that we have a risen Savior who's in this world today. How do we respond to the resurrection? Do we let it come in and grow us and transform us and be challenged and to understand and grow closer to God than we were yesterday, last week, last month, last year? Do we let that happen? Or do we just say, you know, it's another season, it's another year, yeah, we got through it, what's next? If you say, You believe in a risen Savior. If you say you believe in the resurrection, but it stays as an intellectual, philosophical belief, then how do you embody it? How do you wrestle with it? How do you let it come in and grow you to become the creation God created and called each and every one of us to become? I've served in more churches than most of my colleagues. I've served in more locations and cultures than most of my colleagues. And the biggest thing they all struggle with is trying to help their congregations not merely celebrate the power of the resurrection, but to allow that power to permeate them fill them, challenge them, guide them, so that when they are faced with authorities that go against what they believe and what they feel is right, 
They can stand there with faith and conviction, not defiance. Faith and conviction. So there's a piece of humility that comes into it that simply says, I can't do that. My faith doesn't allow it. In that moment, you're doing ministry. In that moment, you're sharing a conviction. You're sharing a belief. In that moment, you're sitting there and saying, God, I do put you above all else. And the things of this world that I know will pass, they are beneath you. That's what it means to look high upon the cross. That's what it means to be a follower, not a believer. That is the working, living definition of what it means to be a Christian. One who responds to the resurrection. Letting it come in. Letting it transform. Facing the things of this world that will throw at us to get our attention away, to have us look somewhere else, to put our faith and money and abilities and time into something else that will give us happiness and satisfaction in the moment, but not for all the days of our lives. There's only one thing that can do that, and that is the loving presence of a powerful, patient, graceful God. And that gift was given to us when he sent his son into this world, born in a stable, 33 years on this earth, three years of intense ministry, where at the end he was set up put through a mock trial, had the tar beat out of him so bad no one knew who he was except his mother and those closest to him, laid in a grave where the authorities of the world went, yup, it's now over, let's move on. And here in Acts, you have the power of that resurrection being revealed to them by those who followed him, saying, yep, you killed him. But he ain't dead. He's not gone. He's not forgotten. He's alive and well, and he's with us with every thought, every step, every breath. And they took that moment to testify, to share, to teach, to preach. The religious, the biblical, the spiritual powerhouses of the Jewish faith. And do you know what they did? They beat him. And then they let him go. And what was the disciples' reaction? Cool. We have been deemed so worthy that we are following the path that our Savior followed. A path that would take them to their death of martyrdom in various ways, in various parts of the Roman Empire, of the known world at that time. And they went to it joyfully, gladfully, gleefully, that's a better word. Because they knew firsthand that God who beloved his son did not abandon him, but resurrected him. And that those of us who follow in the name of Jesus, who live in the name of Jesus, who make decisions in the name of Jesus, who sing, pray, work, act, raise our children, enter our retirement, go get gas in our car, doing it in the name of Jesus. That the promise of that presence of love and grace not being abandoned, we with each and every one of us, every step, every place. And that gave them not a confidence to face the world, but a comfort and a peace that God was with them so they could face the world. How do we respond to the resurrection? It's not something you can choose to do overnight. It's something that we have to work on every day. Every day. Every day to remember that which we are given. 
every day to remember that God is with us, that his son is walking beside us, that his spirit is filling us. Every time we gather and sing a hymn, every time we gather and break bread at communion, it is not a ceremonial ritual that we're going through. It is an invitation to recommit, to be reminded that God is not only alive and well in this world, that our God has not abandoned us to our fears, to the pressures of this world. Because God's love is true and steadfast. So when you think about the resurrection, and you think about how you're responding to it, and if you sit there and go, man, I ain't doing as good as I should be, that's okay. Ask for forgiveness. God will give it. Restore you, embrace you, and allow that embrace to not just be felt on your happy places in your ribcage, but at the very core of your very being. I think that's a great way to start responding. By letting God come in all the way. That way, people see it coming out of us. Would you all pray with me, please? Allow us to respond with reception to you, O God. Allow us to respond with openness to you, O God. Allow us to respond in a way in which we can expect to be surprised as your beauty and your love and the places that you take us and the situations that we find ourselves in unfold in a way in which we can stop and recognize you are there. You have not forgotten us. You have not abandoned us to the finality of doom. But you are empowering us. You are enabling us so that we can grow and be transformed into vessels of your light, vessels of your grace, elements of your love. For in the way you remembered your son Jesus, you remember us as well because and through your son Jesus. Thank you for being so steadfastly dedicated. We give thanks in your son's beautiful and glorious name. Amen.